Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to day one of Megger's Virtual Cable Best Practices Seminar. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the Digital Marketing Specialist for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentations and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenters. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of each presentation. Today, we will have two separate presentations with their own Q&A sessions, so please stick around after our first presentation concludes. The presenters today will be Sergio Razio and Javier Ruiz Leva, both being cable, uh, Megger's Cable Fault Location Test and Diagnostic Area Sales Managers. To assist with our question and answer session today, we will have Henning Ochen, Product Manager for Cable Product. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today, Javier. Thank you, Michael, and thanks to everyone for attending today's uh, uh, seminar. Let's start uh, uh, doing a quick review of the agenda for this short uh, 15 minutes uh, presentation. We'll go first uh, through the basics for medium voltage cables. And we will analyze uh, what is the VLF test, the parameters, and the goals. Also, we will do exactly the same for the 10 delta and the partial discharge test. We will see what those tests are and what parameters are involved and what are the goals of the three of the three test uh, methods. Well, let's uh, start with the basics for medium voltage cables. Uh, we are seeing in the slide the classic uh, single phase cable in which we have a center conductor that could be of copper or aluminum material. Then we have this inner semicon layer. Next, we have the main insulation of the cable. Uh, we'll, we will continue with the other semicon layer. Then uh, next, we will have the neutral concentric shield of the cable. And finally, we will have the jacket or sheet of, of, of the cable. Uh, regarding the constructions of the cable, besides the previous one that was the single phase shielded medium voltage cable, we can have the three core cable in which we have uh, three conductors and each one with its individual shield. Uh, and also well, we have uh, the belted cable. In this case, we have three conductors, but we have a common shield. So this is the different uh, cable constructions we can have in medium voltage cables. Regarding the insulation for medium voltage cables, we have the solid dielectric or the polymeric insulation. You can see in the uh, left of the slide the EPR and the XLP insulation, uh, uh, the XLPE insulations. Uh, they are maybe the most common insulations that we have no day in the in the medium voltage cables and in the right you will see the paper insulated cable that is also we, we can find them also uh, very often in, in medium voltage installations uh, um, in terms of the faults for medium voltage cables we should distinguish between local issues and global issues a local issue will be restricted to a portion of the cable insulation or its accessories. Uh, and mainly, the um, uh, local issues are related with poor workmanship or installation uh, uh, products. By the other hand, the global issues are spread along big segments of the cable, and they are related with the aging conditions of the insulation of the cable. So depending on what problem we are dealing with, is the uh, test we will choose. For instance, if we are dealing with severe installation or manufacture issues, we can use the VLF test. If we are looking for incipient installations or manufacture issues, we can use the partial discharge uh, test. And if we are looking for all cables and we need to, we want to know which cables are the oldest in my uh, population of cables, we can use the 10 delta test. So depending what we are looking for is the, uh, the test we need to choose. Uh, um, what is the VLF test? Let's start talking of VLF test. The VLF test is fundamentally an AC over voltage test. Uh, it's also called an AC hypot. And the frequency we use for this AC over voltage test is 0 0.1 hertz. In the VLF test, some standards allow to decrease the frequency 
some other standards don't allow uh, to do that, okay? But well, normally we will say that the official frequency for the VLF test is 0 0.1 hertz. And the VLF test is pretty much like a pressure test. And we will apply a voltage above operating. The voltage will be prescribed by a standard, for instance, the IEEE 400.2. And we will look for a breakdown. What we want to do during a, during a VLF test is convert in fault the severe issues in the, in the insulation or the accessories of my cable. Uh, we use the VLF test as commissioning test or after repair test and is a go no go or pass fail test. So the limit we will have a limited diagnostic information during the VLF test. The parameters involved in the VLF test are uh, the wave shapes. We have mainly two wave shapes, the sine wave shape that you can see in the uh, graphic in the, in the left. And in the right, we have the cosine rectangular wave shapes. Of course, both technologies, both, both uh, wave shapes have advantage and disadvantage. And maybe we'll go through them in, in the next slide. Um, the test voltage uh, that we use for the VLF test will be between two times U0 and three times U0, where U0 is the rated RMS phase to ground voltage. And the test time will be between 30 and 60 minutes if we are using, for instance, the IEEE 400.2. The frequency must be uh, 0.1 Hertz, but in the VLF test, we have the option to decrease the frequency for instance, when we want to use, when we want to test very, very low cable with sinus units. Um, the goals of the VLF test are convert in bolt a severe problem in the cable insulation and its accessories during the test time, and at lower energy in comparison, in comparison with the service fault. So this is very important. And we will do this under controlled environment and we will, we will avoid, of course, collateral damage. Now let's continue with tan delta test. What is the tan delta test? Well, the tan delta test is a global method of testing cables to provide an estimation of the remaining life expectancy of the insulation. We know that there is a correlation between an increasing 0.1 Hertz tan delta and a decreasing insulation breakdown voltage at, at power frequency. So the tan delta is based on VLF technology. We will use a 0 0.1 Hertz VLF sine wave shape. We cannot use the cosine rectangular for, to do a, a tan delta test. Must be a 0 0.1 Hertz VLF sine wave shape. It's a diagnostic tool. So we will have three assessment criteria. The mean value of the tan delta, the delta of the tan delta, and the standard deviation. And the results can be compared with the tables in the IEEE 400.2. And also it's a prescribed test method by the IEEE 400.2 2013. Um, very important also for the tan delta test, as we can use, as I said, the VLF sane, we must use the VLF sane and the frequency must be 0 0.1 Hertz. We cannot decrease the frequency when we are doing a tan delta test. Huh? We can do that in the VLF test, but we cannot do that when we are doing a tan delta test. The frequency must be fixed and it will be 0 0.1 Hertz. Uh, the parameters involved in the tan delta test is the wave shape. The wave shape must be signed, as I said. The test voltage um, will apply three voltages steps, 0 0.5 do not, one uh, one do not, and 1.5 do not. This is according to the IEEE 400.2. Uh, the test time will depend on the measurements we took per voltage step. The IEEE recommends to between eight to 10 measurements per voltage step, so it will take around 15 minutes. And as I said in the previous slide, the frequency must be 0 0.1 Hertz. 0 0.1 Hertz, we cannot we cannot decrease the frequency when we are doing a 10 delta test. What are the goals of the 10 delta test? Well, detect the aging conditions in the insulation of the cable. For that reason, we will do the 10 delta test in all cables, at least cables that have been in service for five years. 
Uh, the goal is to alert to critical agent cables before in service faults and with up to one to two years notice. And of course, uh, also to help target worse cables first. Uh, now, let's continue with the third method, that is the partial discharge test. The partial discharge are little electrical sparks and they eat the insulation of uh, the cable. And generally, a partial discharge test, generally, I will say, is a non-reversible process. We have exceptions for this, okay? For instance, in the paper insulated cables, we have exceptions. But normally, in general, we will say that the partial discharge is a non-reversible process. Therefore, uh, uh, they will initiate the final cable fault. Uh, so, how we do a partial discharge test? Well, we will apply a high voltage to excite the partial discharge in the cable and its accessories. We can use different uh, wave shapes. For instance, we can use the damped IC. Uh, this is one of the wave shapes we can use. Uh, we can use also the cosine rectangular slope. Not all the not all the wave shape, only the change of polarity is the slope when the change of polarity happens in, in the wave shape uh, cosine rectangular. And also we can use the sine 0 0.1 Hertz VLF wave shape, okay? Um, we will measure the, per the partial discharge activity in the cable. We, will, we want to measure what is the level of the PD activity in my cable, but also I want to localize the PD activity spots in my cable as we can see in the graphic uh, at the bottom of the slide, we can see that we have a cable of close to 6.5 kilometers, and we can see partial discharge in the phase A uh, up to 20 nanocoulombs at, at the beginning of the phase A. And in the phase B and C, we can see close to two kilometers uh, partial discharge in that joint, okay? So this is the idea of the partial discharge not only measure the PD activity, the level of the PD activity, we want also localize the PD activity spots. Uh, what parameter we will measure during a partial discharge test? Well, the charge, of course, the amount of charge, the intensity of each electric breakdown, and we'll, we will typically measure in picocoulombs. Uh, it could be also that we'll measure in nanocoulombs, but typically will be picocoulombs. We will measure also the time, the time the signal from the breakdown takes to the to reach the sensor, and then we will determine the distance to the partial discharge spot. Um, we will measure also uh, the voltage, the applied voltage. We know that there is a dependency of the partial discharge with respect to the voltage, for instance. If we start to see PD activity at 0 0.8 U0 in, in the partial discharge measurement, and we increase the voltage, then the level of the partial discharge will increase. So for the reason, it's important to see the relation between the voltage, the applied voltage, and the level of the PD of the partial discharge. Also very important is the partial discharge inception voltage, that is the voltage when the PD activity starts in the cable, and the partial discharge extinction voltage, that is the, uh, the, the voltage when the PD activity stops in the cable. The goals of the partial discharge is to detect improper installation, manufacture defects, and third-party damage. No day the partial discharge in mainly, is mainly used to detect uh, or to see for poor workmanship uh, issues. Uh, it will provide an early warning of the incipient faults, uh, and we will have the possibility of remedial repair or replacement action during a, a scheduled uh, outage. So um, this is uh, what is the goals of the partial discharge. And now we will continue with the next topic that is the Tan Delta, best practices on Tan Delta, and it will be presented by Sergio Resso. Michael, if you can pass the control to Sergio, please. Sure thing. Sergio, are you ready to receive presenter control? Oh, Sergio, we might still have you on mute.
Yes, there we are. I'm here. Okay. All right. Thank Wonderful. You. Presenter control is heading your way. Um, show my screen. Perfect. There we go. And I think I erased a lot of accident. Yep, we're okay. Uh, so uh, thank you, Javier. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today, as my colleague has mentioned. So uh, what we're going to do is go into when to use TAN Delta. Of course, uh, it's typically used on age cables, uh, five years and greater. And uh, we also use this to detect aging condition change and dielectric properties of these said cables. So as you can see in this picture here, to my right, this is a cable tray with old cables sit into it, a service stage cable. Uh, it's also be used as part of the cable maintenance strategy. It's going to alert you to critically aged cables uh, before in-service fault and up to two years, one to two years notice. Uh, it's also going to be used as part of a cable replacement project. And where this comes into play is that you know it's going to let you target the worst cables first, and it allow you to have the best and wisest choice of the available money in which, depending on how value that asset is, where you should spend your money first. Uh, now we'll go into why to use the TAN Delta. Of course, this is a non-destructive test. And it is very unlikely to fault the cable during or after this test. It's a diagnostic, so it can estimate the health of remaining insulation of an aged cable. And it's also to detect aging conditions and possible unclean accessories as well, albeit either a term or a splice. And then, of course, increase system reliability in the bulk insulation. Uh, what can it detect? It provides an overall condition assessment, estimate life lost in the cable insulation, and it can detect presence of water trees, contaminants and in insulation, insulation moisture, degraded accessories, and oil leakage in pilt cables. If we look here at this picture, this is a, an example of a water tree in the insulation, and here's your semiconductive layer, your outer semicon, and your conductor, whether it be aluminum or copper. What it cannot detect is it cannot locate discrete problems, only that there is or is not a problem. As stated before by my colleague, this is a global assessment. Uh, what specifically the problem is, it cannot detect either. Uh, is it a corroded concentric, a water tree, maybe a dirty term? Uh, problems in the jacket or the lead sheath, uh, poor workmanship, manufacturer defects, Global measurement that does not localize. Basically, this is a leakage current measurement. Not basically, but that's part of what it is doing here. Uh, theoretical approach is the simplistic purposes of the circuit represents a cable with a perfect insulation. If you look here, let me get into my animation here. If the cable insulation is perfect, then the resistor in my circuit, sorry, my webinar thing is blocking my words. Other words, and the value of resistance trends to infinite. This will mean that all the current in my circuit is a capacitive current, and then it is 90 degrees shifted to the voltage applied. As voltage here, there's my resistive. There's the infinite. There's angle. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, this is the sorry. Somebody's knocking at my door. Uh, tan Delta uh, represented here in this slide. Sorry, I'm going over to the next slide. Uh, wave shape frequency. Sorry, we use a sine wave shape. Test frequency is at 0.1 hertz. Number of Tan Delta values, 8 to 10 per voltage step. Which voltage levels? Stepwise increase in voltage. So if you look here on the bottom right, step one is at half uh, new ot. Step two is at operating, and step three is at one and a half. Any questions? Okay, so why we need to use a sinusoidal wave shape? Here's the sinusoidal, as you saw earlier, and then we the the difference is is here on the right the cosine rectangular. We don't have the phase reference between the current and the voltage in this cosine rectangular for the tan delta measurement as opposed to the VLF. And then in a purely capacitive circuit, the current leads the voltage by a 90 degree angle. As applied here, A is the voltage, B is the current, and then this is the time. 
uh, going into this, you're always going to use three voltage levels. So the, the three criteria are how you assess within the standard. And that's key because you want to be able to have all three of these to be in the standard. And also, furthermore on that is that uh, different dielectrics, different types of cables will mask other problems. Uh, so if you look here, this is 0.5, one times, one and a half. This is the mean VLF TD. If you look at our animation, this is the eight to 10 values on between each step. Eight to 10 values all between each step. And this is the equation. Here's the differential VLF TD, which is the DTD as per IEEE 400.2. And then it says here, it's 10 delta, the behavioral to increase the voltage. Look here, this is the average of those 10. Oh, sorry, I went a little too fast. This is the average between these here, these here, and these here. This is your value for the DTD. And then VLF tan delta time stability for the standard deviation is the difference between each measurement, all 10 in between each step, is the standard deviation, as you can see on the scale as we grow up. These ones, this standard deviation is higher, and then so on and so forth. Uh, the assessment criteria is the measured values of the TD, DTD, and standard deviation are primarily influenced by the conditions of the cable system components. So historical figures, table four is the historical figures of merit for condition assessment of service age PE-based insulations, e.g. PE, XOPE, and TRXOPE using 0.1 hertz. So this is the, the table in the 400.2. If you see here on the left, it's condition assessment, no action required, further sturdy, advised and action required. VLF TD, so this is actually backwards from what we've shown, but this will be the first slide. Mean VLF TD at operating would be less than four, would be no action required. Four to 50, further study advised. Greater than 50, action required. This would be our DTD, difference in mean at 0.5 to one and a half. Less than five, no action. Five to 80, further study advised. Greater than 80, action required. And then VLF TD time stability would be, of course, standard deviation. Less than 0.1, no action. 0.1 to 0.5, further study advised. And then, of course, greater than 0.5, action required. Assessment criteria. So breaking those each action down, no action required means no indication of severe problem in the short term. The cable system can be returned to service and the cable system should be retested at some later date, maybe four years. Further study advice would be additional information is needed to make an assessment comparing historical TD results of the tested cable system. Uh, this is important because historical would mean that you've done this more than once in an aged circuit, not new, in an aged circuit. Uh, I, an example of this would be maybe a, a cable run that uh, before had a failure, you added a splice. and it, So you had the data before the splice and then you would have it after the splice. Additional diagnostics test, monitored withstand test, visual analysis of circuit components, and then of course action required would be poor insulation condition, the cable system should be considered for replacement for repair immediately. Uh, this is voltage dependency of the tan delta. If you look here, this is just like we were discussing a minute ago. This is on time. If you look at our table here, this is you have the red reference cable, which is new. The yellow, which is slightly serviced age. The green is moderately serviced age at two years, moderately serviced age at three, strongly serviced age. So if you look here at this scale, Voltage dependency of the tan delta of the new and service age medium voltage XLPE power cables. Important factor for decision making process is the tan delta, also called tip up. So if you look here at this one and a half times of this aged cable, you can see here how this is a dramatic jump up from the new to the moderate to the service age to the slightly. Oh, sorry. And this is where those trend, those, the, the values come into play. So, how to interpret results. So this is a this is a uh, report section of the tan delta. This far left representing the tan delta values. This representing the voltages at each step. 
And then this is representing other phases in each set. So phase one, phase two, phase three. And if you look, this is a tan delta on good cables. If you look how they trend between the voltage ranges coming up. And then how we're going to interpret results here. So this is the same cable. One is in the rain and one is in the sunny day. So if you look here at the voltage KV is 12.7 here, 19 here, 25.4 here. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> phase one, phase two, phase three. This is your 10 delta value at each step. And if you look here, 589, 602, 711, represented by this blue phase here in L3. Then you say the same exact cable here uh, on the sunny day now, same voltage range, 12, 7, 19, 254. Phase one, 338, 388, 500 as compared to 589 in the rain. Phase two, 343, 394, 477, as opposed to 602 in the rain. And then phase three, 369, 426, 497, as compared to 711 in the rain. So tan delta is a measure of temperature and humidity. It's also a factor in this. How to interpret the results. So if you look here, this is a wet cable. Do you see phase one is green, phase two is red, phase three is three. Same scale, tan delta and voltage. Now, if you look where this starts, when the cable is wet, see how initially it starts high here on phase three, and then as the voltage is applied and increased, you actually see a decrease, letting you know that it is that it is water. So that's what this cable does here under an actual wet. Uh, limitations of tan delta. In order to meet the standard, the frequency, as, as my colleague mentioned before, must be 0 0.1 hertz, 0 0.1 hertz for tan delta. If other frequencies are used other than one point, then 0 0.1 hertz, and we cannot use the tables of the IEEE 400.2 to evaluate the tan delta. Uh, what, another limitation is the limited length of the cables under test, around three kilometers. And then the, another major factor is when measuring hybrid insulation types on the same circuit, i.e. you have some EPR, some PILC, maybe some of it is XLPE and you've tied that in. The different insulations will mask the defects depending on what insulations you have in that circuit. And these are the limitations of all 10 delta values. And of course, if you're not using the 0.1 hertz and the three steps, there's no table to compare to. Uh, the tan delta is a scalar quantity dimensionless unit. The measurement is a function of temperature and humidity, as I stated before, and it's the measure of the loss angle, ratio of resistive and capacitive current. As cables age, the insulation of the resistance of resistance decreases, the resistive current increases, and the angle increases. Compare this angle to the IEEE 400.2 2013 tables, and you are able to make the proper assessment. Excuse me. <clears throat> what we have here is our product list for PLF sign units with internal tan delta. So here we have a 45 kV unit and a 62 kV unit. Uh, all of these units have a built in standard assessment reporting already in these units. So these units not only have the VLF technology with the sine wave, uh, they also have the built in tan delta. So no need for an external. Uh, missile type connection or extra connections to be able to have your your uh, 10 delta values and all of the reporting that we just went over is also built into the assessment report so for for the end user this is great because as you introduce what cable you're at and the voltages you're using uh, the standard is built in and it'll give you an automatic assessment so making that an even easier unit to use going forward with your technicians and looking at data uh, this is a VLF and TD test using a, a graph to show you how the connections work. So if you look here, here's our box. This is your power cord for this actual unit. Your grounding, which is going to be usually at your single point, whether it be at your transformer or your connection, uh, your uh, switch. And then this is your high voltage lead to your conductor, whether it be NEMA hole, load break or dead break. And then the return, which is always right outside the termination where it where it enters out of the termination uh, and of course this is your single point and this very simply is the connections to be able to take these measurements 
what we have here is the top of the screen looking down at these units. As you can see, this is your jog wheel. It has, this is how you control, it's your mouse. It's gonna allow you to go into all the functions of the actual uh, unit itself. This is your E stop. Number two here is your power. Number three is your key interlock for lockout tag out. Green is your power on, red is your power off. Number six is your USB. And then number seven is your screen, which looks like this. And this is the actual control panel that you'll be looking at. So if you hear it's a VLF Sinus 45 unit, it is a date and timestamp for you so that you never lose that data. It has the, the standard that you'll be using at this in this particular is 400.2, one and a half times. L1 action required. Uh, of course, here's the VLF 10 Delta. And this is your jog wheel as you use your mouse. It's telling you the phases that you've already done, that you're grounded, and so on and so forth. This is a doing a tan delta test. This is an actual data sheet. So once the test is done, of course, it's going to give you this automatic IEEE 400.2 uh, standard assessment for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. This here is a report. Actually, let me blow this up. So if you look here at this report, this is a project cable information. So you can enter in your cable, your cable type, what it is, one out, 220 mils, location, your start, your end, the voltages you're using, the phase you're on, cable size, so on and so forth. In your notes here, you can add obviously where your connections are, but also remember we are saying that tan delta is a, is a function of temperature and humidity. You can put what the temperature and humidity is here too, so that as you see this data, you'll be able to know, was this actually affecting me? Was it raining on me? So on and so forth. If you look here is this graph, just like we were showing earlier, but now it's in the report of this L1 phase. These are your voltage steps. And if you look phase one, L1, voltage was 14.9, frequency was 0.1, capacitance was 43. Here's your average tan delta at 43.4. Delta TD was 52.9. Standard deviation is 0.71. Average tan delta result. And here it has all three of each phase or, or of each step. And your result, of course, is action required. And the criteria, it even breaks it down to as to what criteria you are going to. And the inspector or user as you like. Uh, here's another look at those same things. So this is the action reserve results as this whole system works. Okay. Uh, these are the webinars about VLF TD uh, that we have on the web. So this is the usmegger.com uh, webinar, the YouTube, uh, and I'll leave these links up here for a few seconds if you would like to write them down or take pictures of them. But these are additional training. And we'll also have those in the uh, follow-up email going out tomorrow morning with a copy of these presentations and recording of the webinar. So don't feel too pressured to write these down exactly at this moment. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. They will be at the end of the presentation. Uh, this is the contact information for me, Sergio Razo, uh, srazo at mega.com, USA Sales. Uh, I'm officially over the Southeast region, but we are all a team, so we will help whoever is in need. And then the questions. Wonderful. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, so Sergio, we'll have you pause your screen here on questions so we can get into our Q&A uh, real quick. Uh, as a reminder, we will have a copy of this presentation, uh, the recording of the seminar, and any external links mentioned therein on an email going out to everyone who's in attendance right now, uh, tomorrow morning, so you can prepare for our second day uh, tomorrow at the same time. Additionally, we will have a secondary uh, presentation right after this Q&A uh, session, which is going to be very short, so stick around. Uh, while we mention our Q&A session, we're going to jump right in and send our first question to Henning Ochin. Henning, are you with us? Yes. <clears throat> All right, oh, yeah. wonderful. So our first question, Henning, is going to be, why do we use one hertz AC test? Okay, the problem with AC testing in the field is because of the reactive power you need to charge a cable every uh, eight milliseconds and discharge it, you would need a huge power supply, which is not practical for field testing. Uh, in a factory, they can do it. You know, the cable factories do that with 60 hertz. But in field testing, that's why I 
people were looking for a method, an AC test that would, and operating at a lower frequency, you cut the amount of power required by the ratio of the frequency. So if you go to, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, from 60 Hertz to, to 0.1 Hertz, you cut it down by 600 times. And that makes it feasible to do an AC test in the field. All right, thank you, Henning. Uh, while I have you, I'm gonna send the next question to you as well. What are the pros and cons for single conductor versus multi-conductor cables? Uh, you know, that is a, um, I don't know, there is not a right or wrong answer. <clears throat> it's just an answer. You know, typically old cables, initially uh, three-phase cables, they were all paper cables, paper insulated cables. They were what we call segment or uh, sector cables. Um, so they were taped uh, conductors and shaped conductors. And what, what it really did is it allowed a very small cross section for a cable to be put in the ground. And that is clearly an advantage of a multi-conductor cable that it has overall a smaller cross section, especially when it's a sector cable. And sector cable you can figure as if you if you take a, a, a circle and you cut it in um, in three equal uh, segments, that is what a segmented cable uh, uh, looked like. Uh, today, uh, when you go to solid dielectric cables, those cables are not done this way anymore. And most of the time, uh, they use three individual cables that are triplexed together. That still gives you a little smaller cross section than having three individual cables. There is not really, I think, a, a advantage, disadvantage of multi-core uh, multi with a single core, but uh, it is a, a today sometimes it's a problem when you replace old paper cables with XLP cables that the, the conduit or the ductwork that's available will not allow to put the new the new cables in, and that's why some companies have gone to what's called a reduced insulation a wall so they can use the old conduit. All right, thank you, Henning. Um, Javier, I'll send this question over to you. What is the relationship between TD and breakdown voltage of cables? Could you brief this out for us? Well, uh, indeed, uh, uh, it's very untypical that we have a uh, very downstream at delta test, okay? Uh, and we need to keep in mind that the IEEE uh, 400.2 reduced the voltage for the 10 delta test from two, two times uh, G0 in 2004, that was uh, the standard. And in 2013, they reduced the voltage to maximum 1.5 G0. So it's very untypical that we will have a fault during 10 delta test. Uh, for the VLF test, it's very often that sometimes we have uh, faults during the VLF test. And there is a, 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 a paper or an article of the Dortmund Wasser und Energy, that is a German company, in which they established that for the VLF test, uh, and the, during the first half hour, we have almost 75% of the faults, okay? But for the title of the test, uh, I will say that it's very untypical to have faults. But maybe just as a brief comment on this, there is not a direct relationship between 10 delta value and breakdown. You cannot say if I have a 10 delta of X, that means I will have a breakdown of Y, okay? That there's no direct relationship. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Uh, Henning. Uh, what is the reason behind unequal leakage behind, uh, between phases on the same cable? Does this require you to perform diagnostic tests for a higher leakage phase during VLF high pots? Well, uh, I assume uh, uh, he has talked about a three-phase cable with three individual cables. And um, uh, it's, it's very common that all three cables will not show the exact same, let's say, dielectric properties, whether it's, you know, 10 delta or, or leakage current or whatever. 
and that has to do with the fact that <clears throat> uh, when the when the cables are installed, they're not actually treated identical. So one cable could get some damage that the other two phases don't get. So uh, uh, when you have one phase that sticks out that is much higher in let's say in this case 10 delta, that's what we talk about here, then you would have to to uh, to see what what it can mean. Uh, um, if we look at the 10 delta criteria, like uh, Sergio was pointing out, the tip-up factor is a very important one. <clears throat> and um, uh, so if you have a large tip-up, that, that could suggest that you have somewhere in, the, in that particular phase, some ionization, which could happen maybe in a, in a splice or could happen in a termination or theoretically also in the cable, but typically not. Um, where on the other side, if you just had a elevated 10 delta, but the slope of the 10 delta or the tip up is very steady, that means it's just the, the baseline of that particular cable for whatever reason is higher, but it's less less dangerous, by far less dangerous compared to a high tip up. But whenever you get a high tip up in one phase, you should uh, do more testing and think about you know what it could be and maybe do a partial discharge test or or sometimes even could be as as easy to try to change our determination because when termination especially when they're exposed to the elements for a long time maybe 20 30 years they could also develop some uh, deterioration that could lead to a high 10 delta a tip up okay Thank you, Henning. Um, Javier, can any cable test be done on an energized cable? Well, in the case of the VLF test and the 10 delta test, there is no way. I mean, uh, we need to de-energize the cable to connect our, our power source or VLF. <laughs> in the case of the next topic, that will be partial discharge. And we will see that there is two two ways to do the partial discharge test. That is the conventional and unconventional. And in the non-conventional, you can measure partial discharge on energized cable. Okay, but for the PLF, tan delta, and for the conventional partial discharge measurement, you need a de-energized cable. Thank you, Javier. Um, Henning. Can partial discharge detect the water ingress in the straight cable or joint? Is uh, partial discharge sensitive to water ingress or a water tree? Okay, we have to, to go back to what does partial discharge mean? Partial discharge is a, a, um, a, um, a uh, when a, you have a discharge in a, in a gas, could be in air, could be in uh, in other gases. But so in order to get a discharge, you need a high resistance because otherwise you cannot get a discharge. So because you have to build the voltage up and then it, it uh, basically flashes. So when you have water ingress, that does the opposite. Water ingress uh, basically reduces the insulation resistance, makes it m much, much lower resistance and in that regard, uh, uh, it cannot, PD, partial discharge, cannot uh, detect water ingress and cannot detect water trees. There was a big discussion in IEEE about this topic many years ago, and um, it's a very good uh, write-up in, uh, in the IEEE 400.3, which is a partial discharge field test guide, uh, about water trees and uh, and uh, its relation to being able to use PD uh, to detect water trees. It's not possible, okay? Because from the physics point of view, you need a, a gas discharge and a, to get the gas discharge, you need a high resistance and you don't have a high resistance with water. All right, thank you, Henning. Um, Javier. Uh, are there any standard specs that I can incorporate into my project specs? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, for instance, for for acceptance tests, we can acceptance or maintenance tests. We can use the IEEE 400.2. Uh, 
uh, also for 10 delta applies that standard. Uh, for partial discharge, we can use the IEEE 400.3 uh, and 0.4. Uh, for sure, yeah, there, there is multiple standards, not only in the IEEE, also in the IEC for uh, for tests, for uh, commissioning tests, maintenance tests, and also for 10 delta and, and partial discharge. Uh, maybe uh, we will add in the presentation that you will receive uh, a, a slide with the, the most uh, important standards that maybe you could, you could uh, uh, use for your projects. Thank you, Javier. Additionally, is a DC high pot test a prerequisite for a VLF test? No. Indeed, for XLPE and EPR cables, the DC high pot is no longer recommended. Uh, only we, we will be able to use or we will recommend to use the DC high pot on paper insulated cables, okay? But no, for sure, if you if you are dealing with uh, solid dielectric cables, EP or XLP, uh, for sure, uh, the only that you need is the VLF, and indeed the high, DC high pot is no longer recommended. Hello. Hello. I think that we lost uh, Michael. Uh, well, no, I, so I, mean, I, I fat fingered my mute button. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it looks like we only have time for one more question before we have to move on to our next uh, presentation. Uh, and I'm going to send it over to Henning. Henning, which is the best method of cable testing, VLF or DAC tests? Okay. Which is superior? So let me make a, a basic statement. There are no good and no bad tests. There are different types of tests that are available and any test method that is commercially available today has been proven to be good test method. The real question is what are you trying to do by testing a cable? What do you want to learn about a cable? And in, in, in that regard, the BLF and the DAC tell you different things. So the, uh, the, uh, the DAC test, which is a partial discharge test, obviously can, like any partial discharge test, is an excellent test to find uh, workmanship issues in termination and splices. Uh, because whenever you have splices and terminations, you're adding different type of materials on top of each other which leaves the possibility of having gaps in between these layers, air gaps in this case. And whenever you have air gaps, you can get partial discharge, you can get a, a gas discharge in air. And that's why it's a very good test to do that. Now the VLF test is a totally different test. The VLF test is a withstand test. And um, it, it can find out if the insulation is compromised in terms of its, let's say, insulation resistance. So if you have a low insulation resistance, that means if you if you go to the test voltage, you get leakage current. The higher the leakage current, eventually the leakage current will lead to failure. Right. So that's that's one of the the um, the uh, uh, passes or the, the the ways that cable can fail under 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 VLF. But it can also fail if you have a gap, like a partial discharge. Uh, you get, uh, if you go high enough in the high pot voltage, uh, which you normally go, you know, VLF testing is about on new cables three per unit. So you can create ionization current. And I, once you get ionization current, that means the same as your leakage current goes way up and it leads to failure. So it does, it does different things. The, the PD test is a diagnostic test to hopefully in the forefield see whether you have a compromised cable somewhere, a spot that is compromised, and you can replace it or repair it before it fails. 
the, the, the VLF test in its basic form is a high pot, it's a withstand test, it's go no go. It either is good or it's bad. And so they do different things to it. And um, actually there is a combination of the two, which is mentioned in 400.2. It's called a monitor withstand test where you can use a high pot test and at the same time, monitor for instance partial discharge if you wanted to do that what does that do it's a very good method to to check basically for all the possible defects whether they are local defects gas discharge like in pd or they are from resistive driven defects like kinks or cuts in the cable and that will be addressed by the by the vlf test but there is no good or bad test it, they tell you different things Thanks for that, Henning. Uh, so it looks like that's all the time we're going to put towards this Q and A session. And I'm not exaggerating. We have we have over 50 great questions that we really should be addressing right now. We just don't have the time, unfortunately. We'll try and follow up with you offline. If you have anything that's pressing that you think we would like to address a little bit earlier than we would normally, please reach out to us offline. We love hearing from you guys. Uh, with that, I'm going to send control back over to Javier Ruiz. Uh, Javier, are you ready to be a uh, presenter again? Yes. All right, Thanks, here Javier. we are. All right, and we are good to go. Here, if you're gonna open up another one, pause for us real quick. There we go, perfect. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks, Michael. So, okay, yeah. uh, so uh, let's uh, start uh, talking of, of PD measurement. Uh, the first that we need to, uh, maybe the first answer we need to, to uh, the first question we need to answer is what is a partial discharge? If you go to Wikipedia, you will try, you will find this definition is in a, a partial discharge is a localized the electric breakdown which does not completely bridge the space between the two conductors of a portion of a solid or fluid electrical insulation under high voltage stress. If you see uh, the drawing we have in the slide, we have two conductors in red, and in between we have the insulation. And inside of the insulation, we have a air bubble or a cavity uh, filled with air. So what happens with this device is under high voltage, is that the uh, high voltage will build up in, inside the cavity and we will have a breakdown, we will have a spark. And every time that happens, the walls that constrain the air bubble or the cavity will be carbonized. So sooner or later, we will have a fault between the two conductors. So this is the uh, definition of a partial discharge. So, uh, when we will use partial discharge? When, when to use partial discharge? Well, we, we, we can use partial discharge as commissioning tests or after cable repair tests. And the idea or the goal is to find improper installation, manufacture defects or third part damage. Uh, partial discharge is especially good to find uh, poor warmanship issues or uh, manufacture defects or also installation uh, problem. For instance, if somebody, uh, if we have, uh, if the cable was bent too much, we, can, we will have a chance to find that kind of issues with uh, partial discharge. As you can see in these pictures, we, uh, the guy that fixed um, the cable in the holder exceed uh, the torque. And for this reason, they deformed the insulation of the cables. So for that kind of problems is that partial discharge will help us. And uh, so the partial discharge will provide an early warning of incipient, incipient faults. And we will have the possibility of remedial repair or replacement action during already skewed uh, planet outage. Uh, um, so how the, tendota, how the partial discharge works, sorry, how the partial discharge works. As I mentioned, uh, we have two ways to measure partial discharge, the conventional way and the non-conventional way. In the conventional way, in the conventional way, we need to connect in the circuit between the power source and the cable under test a coupling capacitor. 
So we need to energize the cable in order to connect the power, the, the coupling capacitor and the power source. And in the conventional way, uh, when we use the coupling capacitor, we will work under the IEC 6270. Okay, so only only when we work in the conventional way is allowed to speak of picocoulombs. We will see in the next slides that we will measure the partial discharge and the, the, the unit of the partial discharge is the coulomb. And we will measure very small quantities of, of charge. For this reason, we will measure in picocoulombs at the best nanocoulombs, okay? But it's only in the conventional way we'll, uh, we will need to calibrate uh, this circuit. And when we calibrate the circuit, what we do is to put a calibrator at the beginning of the cable. We will inject a PD pulse in the cable. And what will happen is that uh, uh, the energy of the PD pulse we are injected with the, coup, with, with the calibrator will split in two. Uh, the first part of the energy will go back uh, straight to the coupling capacitor. And the second part of the energy will go all its way to the end of the cable, and then we'll go back to the coupling capacitor. Then during the calibration, we will have two pulses, the first one and the second one, okay? And this uh, principle is the same that we will use to localize, localize the partial discharge. We have, uh, let's say, an air bubble inside of the insulation of a cable, so we will have the partial discharge, the energy will be split in two, part of the energy will go straight to the beginning of the cable, to the coupling capacitor, and the second part of the energy will go to the end of the cable, and then we'll go back to the coupling capacitor. Then, as I said, uh, we will have two uh, pulses, okay? And these pulses will, ha will have a difference in time, the difference between the arri arrival of the first pulse and the arrival of the second pulse. So we will have a difference in time, and we will know the propagation velocity of the partial discharge pulse, so we can uh, localize the PDS spot in the cable. Huh? So it's the, it's the way also, uh, it is the way how we localize the partial discharge spots in the cable. So what we will measure during a PD test, the charge, the charge is very important, the amount of charge, which means the intensity of each dielectric breakdown. And typically we will measure in picocoulombs. Also, we will measure the time, as, I, as we saw in the previous slide, the time is very important. The time, uh, the, signal, uh, the time the signal from the breakdown takes to reach the sensor, I mean the coupling capacitor, and then we can determine the distance. The voltage is also very important because uh, there is a dependency of the partial discharge versus uh, the voltage, which means that if we detect PD activity at 0.8 eight do not, and we increase the voltage to one do not, the level of the partial discharge will increase. So that uh, relation is also important. Uh, the, other, the other two parameters that are very important is the partial discharge inception voltage, which means the voltage when the PD activity starts in the cable, and the partial discharge extinction voltage. That is the voltage when the PD activity stops in my cable. For that reason, we recommend to increase the voltage uh, step by step to detect or to find the PDIB and the PDEV. Uh, we have some guidelines uh, for uh, for the partial discharge test. For instance, here we we see that for aged cables in this guideline, we have that for for instance um, for a maintenance partial discharge test. The insulation must be PD free. So in, in a maintenance test, we should have not partial discharge in the insulation of the cable. But for instance, in the splices, we can allow up to uh, one picocoulomb, okay? Or, or, well, sorry, less than 1000 picocoulombs. That will be the limit, okay? For, for aged cable and the splices, we, will, we should have less than one 
1,000 picocoulombs, and the same for determinations, less than 1,000 picocoulombs. So we have different guidelines and we can use them to make a decision after we do a, a partial discharge test. Uh, once we're done with the partial discharge um, uh, measurement, we will have a complete report and we can uh, analyze the report in order uh, to make a decision. For instance, in this table, we're seeing that, sorry, this is in Spanish, my apologies, but what we have in the first row is the background noise level, the background noise level. And you can see that almost is the same, the same background noise level for the three phases. But in the phase L3, you can see that we have the partial discharge inception voltage was 19.8 kV. And for and, and the partial discharge extinction voltage was 10.4 kV. Uh, so uh, by the other hand, in the phase L1 and L2, we, di we didn't find any kind of PD activity. And the other very important parameter is the PD level and maximum voltage. In this case, we apply up to two times U0. And you can see that in the phase L3, we get uh, PD level up to 5,788 uh, picocoulombs. So this is uh, the way we know that in the phase of three, we have partial discharge activity. It's very important that we have a good calibration. It's, that is very important. Sometimes I see some reports in which the calibration was not uh, successful. So this is very important that when we analyze a report of partial discharge, we see the calibration. And also it's very important the location of the PD activity. The location of the PD activity. If you see, we didn't have PD activity in the phase L1 and L2 for the reason we don't have any, uh, any dots, uh, blue and, and, and orange dots in, 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 the, in the graphic, but in the phase of three, you can see that we get a lot of partial discharge at the end of the cable. The cable was 500 meters. So you can have, you can see very clear in this uh, graphic that the problem was with the phase of three and the problem was at the end. In this case, uh, the level of the partial discharge as we saw in the previous slide, and we can see right now was five, 1,788 uh, uh, picocoulombs, which is above of the guideline we show in the previous slides. So the guys that made this uh, PD measurement should replace the termination of this cable. So what is important when we are doing a PD measurement? One of most important parts of the PD measurement is ensuring a good connection to the test object, okay? You are seeing one example of the connection of the setup, so the connection of, of uh, PLF with the coupling capacitor, okay? And it's very important that during the connections, um, uh, we, be, we be very careful doing all the connections between the cable under test and our unit, because a faulty connection could cause uh, that we have an increased background noise level or maybe we should create partial partial discharge in, in the circuit. We can put partial discharge in the circuit doing a, a, a faulty connection, uh, or maybe we'll create a partial discharge at the near termination. Uh, the other problem we can have when we have a faulty connection is that no PD, no partial discharge activity will be measured at all, or will will not be able to load the test object. Okay, so. Uh, it, it's important to have a very good connection between the PD equipment and the cable under test. Uh, we need to be always sure that we will connect the ground of the equipment on the same point, point as the return. If you see in this uh, drawing, we have uh, the high voltage uh, lead of my cable connected to the cable, uh, to the cable under test, but the grounding is connected uh, uh, in, in this boost bar. And what we need to do when we're doing partial discharge tests is that the grounding must be connected at the same point where we connected the high voltage uh, 
uh, test lead, the return of the high voltage lead, the return. So this is very important to avoid the antenna effect during the measurement. So always try to connect the grounding of your uh, PD equipment in the return and in the point where you are connecting the return of your high voltage uh, cable. Uh, here we're seeing an example of a PD measurement. It was made in a cable with a length of almost uh, 21,000 uh, feet. The insulation was XLPE and the voltage was 35 kV. And you can see uh, in, here in the um, horizontal axis, axis, we have the, the length of the cable is 6.5 kilometers, which means around 21,000 feet. And you can see in the uh, vertical axis, the level of the partial discharge detected. And you can see that in the phase A, we have PD activity at the beginning of the cable. And the problem was that we didn't have a PD free connection. For that reason, it's very important to have a, P, a PD free connection between the cable under test and our high voltage test lead, okay? But in the phase B and C, you can see that at uh, 5,900 feet, we have PD activity in the phase B and C. So when we open the, uh, when we take out the splice, the joint, we saw that the guy that made this splice didn't put uh, the mastic to seal the screw hole. Okay, you can see here the screw holes. And sometimes in the connectors, you need to be, to put a mastic to seal that holes. They didn't do in this uh, splice, and that was the reason of the partial discharge activity in the measurement. Uh, for finish the presentation, I would like to show you uh, show you some of the PD equipment we have in Megar. The first unit we have is the Dampet AC or the DAC 30 kV. This unit is only to perform the partial discharge test for 15, kilo, 15 kV cables. And uh, it's, it's a unit that reaches up to 30 kV peak. And this is, uh, we use the dampet AC, the dampet AC weight shape to perform the PD test. Then the next uh, units we have uh, in MEGA is the uh, TDS NT 40 kV and 60 kV. We have two models, and uh, the, the first one, the TDS NT 40, is for 15 and 25 kV cables, and the TDS NT 60 is for 15, 25, and 35 kV cables. In the TDS NT models, we have uh, two options, uh, two versions. The basic, ver the basic version, for instance, for the TDS 40, will have 2.5 uh, for microfarads, and the plus version we will have 4.8 microfarads. In the case of the TDS60, the, the basic version will have one microfarad, and the plus version will have two microfarads, which means that uh, if we have more test capacitance, will allow us to test longer cables. So this is um, the TDS NT40 and 60 kV, and we have we can do the VLF test and also the partial discharge test using the dampet AC wave shape. The next unit, uh, the next units we have um, oh sorry. The next units we have is the VLF sign 30. It's a sign wave shape uh, uh, technology unit. Uh, it's a very small unit. In this case, we can do the VLF test. We can also do the tan delta test, but in this case, uh, we need an external tan delta attachment. We need an external tan delta attachment for the VLF side 34. And for the PD test, we will use this QP capacitor that is our PDS, PDS 62. The next unit we have is the VLF sign 45 kV. It's also a 0.1. This unit also uses a 0 0.1 hertz sine wave shape. Um, in this case, we can do also the VLF test. 
We have an internal 10 delta, as uh, Sergio mentioned, we have an internal 10 delta built up in the unit. And uh, if we want to do the partial discharge test, we need our PDS 62 also. And next we have the uh, TDM sign 4540 KV unit that is really a very interesting unit because we will have everything we need for BLF 10 delta and partial discharge. The TDM is a BLF sign 45, but we can uh, uh, put a booster. And with the booster, we will have also the cosine rectangular wave shape to do the VLF test. Uh, and with the booster, we will have access to the cosine rectangular wave shape for the VLF test. But also, we will have access to the damping AC for the partial discharge test. And of course, as is uh, if this is a VLF sine wave shape unit, we can do also, we can use the VLF sine 0.1 hertz um, wave shape to do the 10 delta. So with the TDM sine 4540 kV, we will have access to all the wave shapes or the more important wave shapes that we use for the PLF test, for the 10 delta, and for the partial discharge test. We, have, we can have different options depending on what we are looking for. We can have the, VLF, the TDM45 with 10 delta and VLF only. We can have the TDM45 with the VLF, the 10 delta, and the partial discharge option. We can have the TDM4540 with the booster only to have the VLF sinus and the VLF cosinus rectangular for the VLF test. And we can have the VLF or uh, the TDM4540 with the poster, which will allow us to do the VLF with the sinus wave shape, with the cosinus wave shape. We will can do we will do the 10 delta and we can do also the partial discharge test with the same with the sinus uh, wave shape, with the uh, damped AC and with the slope of the cosine rectangular wave shape. So depending on what you are looking for, you can select the options for the TDM uh, sign 4540 series, and depending on what you are looking for, we can provide it. Okay, so it's very convenient unit. And the last one, the last unit we have is our VLF sign 62. This is a, is a sinus uh, VLF, uh, has an internal 10 delta, and also we can use the PDS 62 to do the partial discharge test. So uh, this is the, the biggest um, uh, VLF, the, VLF, the biggest sinus VLF we have. And uh, this is uh, our VLF sinus 62. And, and is a very nice unit because uh, the cable is integrated in the unit, also the partial discharge. So it's a very convenient unit. And with this, uh, I think that we is all what I have for you guys. So I'm ready to have some questions if you have it. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Javier. So before we jump into the Q&A session for this presentation, a few things I'm going to go over. First off, if you do have any questions you'd like us to address for this seminar, please put them into the Q&A box there on the side or the questions panel rather. Uh, for those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a brief survey should pop up on the screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve our future webinars. Uh, on that survey, there is a field where you can also request a demo or quote on any mega products. A copy of these presentations, certificate of attendance, along with a link to the video recording of the seminar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days, although I will try and aim to have them out by tomorrow morning in the central daylight time zone. Uh, you can also view uh, previous recordings of webinars on our website at us.megar.com slash webinars. And be sure to join us tomorrow for the second day of our virtual cable best practices seminar, where we will be covering cable fault location by underground infrastructure and tools. All right, so let's jump into our questions. The first one I have, I'm going to be sending over to our uh, Henning Ochen. So Henning. Factory PD is five PC max. Why so high a field for PD at a thousand PC? 
why we have to distinguish between factory testing and field testing. The factory testing established a, a minimum acceptance criteria for the quality of the of the is uh, in this case for the um, um, uh, splice of termination. So they do factory testing. They say, okay, it has to be below a certain level to be acceptable because how long is this piece going to be out in the field? It's not out there for one year. It's probably on average out for 30 years. It's the same like, you know, when you do factory testing on cables, you're testing at a very different level uh, because when the cable is new, it can, it can take, it must take a whole lot more. So it can, under normal aging conditions still function after 30 years okay so that's the biggest difference the thousand pc here that's mentioned this was a number was given for uh, you know for um, uh, splices and you have to be careful when you uh, when you uh, these numbers uh, you know you have to be a little uh, careful about using numbers when you talk about pd levels acceptable pd levels because it depends what the splice is made from you know or the termination is made from if you have solid dielectric they they have typically lower acceptable levels than fluid filled termination or or splices so but like i say this the thousand in the field is a, a a number that when you come to that number when you measure that number you need to do something about it it's it's a it's a warning flag where the 5 pc is what it should be when it leaves a factory so it is two different things it's very hard to you know really you cannot compare field testing to uh, factory testing because um, uh, you know you're testing for for different for different purpose. On the one side, you want to make a quality assurance test, which is a factory test. And the other one is you want to see what the actual field condition of it is, which can be a very, or should, will be a very different number because you have all the aging and all the other influences that you experience during the life of the, of the circuit. Thank you, Henning. Well, I have you. Uh, how does the condition of the neutral or cable metallic shield affect the PD test results? Well, that depends a little bit how you do the PD testing. Um, <clears throat> normally, when we do single-ended uh, measurements, uh, it doesn't have that big of an effect compared to when you do actually make measurements in the return uh, circuit. Uh, then the condition of the neutral is very, very important, uh, and corrosion would be detrimental. But uh, it, it also, on when we do single-ended measurements, if you have really a badly corroded neutral, it it will create issues on your PD measurement. So um, um, it, it's 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 not especially also, for instance, on the really old cables where you had unjacketed cable where the, the neutral was in contact with the with the earth or the ground, the earth ground, uh, uh, you you could have big trouble like with any other also, uh, you know, dielectric type measurements uh, uh, on, on these type of cables. So um, uh, if you have, a, if you have a jacketed cable, typically it's the condition of the neutral is is good enough to get a good uh, partial discharge reading. Thank you, Henning. Um, Javier, is it required to disconnect both ends of the cable during tests? I will say yes. Uh, I will say that uh, in, in the, big, the vast majority of the cases, we will need to disconnect um, both ends. Uh, because other way we, will, we, we could have some PD activity and at the ends of uh, the far end, okay, for instance, and, and maybe we will know, we will, we will not be able to know if the PD activity coming from the far end is because we live connected to cable or because we have problems in the termination. So I will say yes, and for, it's necessary to disconnect the cable for both ends. 
Thank you, Javier. Uh, Henning, what is the proper time we should wait during applying high voltage to get proper PD activities in the case of different applied voltages? Well, uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, I mean, there is no waiting period. Once you bring the cable up to the particular voltage level you want to use to evaluate the cable for PD, uh, the PD doesn't have a a let's say a waiting time to 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 uh, uh, to start showing up. Um, so it's not like you have a hesitation or you know have to wait uh, some time before it uh, it will will happen. Typically, once you that's why you look at the inception voltage. You know when you bring the voltage up and you you uh, you see where the inception voltage is, and then you look where the extinction voltage is. But there should be no waiting time. And I'm not aware that you have a, that there's any difference between AC, VLF, and, and DAC. Okay. Thank you, Henning. Um, Javier, uh, do you recommend to do uh, PD tests in two stages? Uh, first, before joints and termination while the cable is open, and the second test after joints and terminations have been completed but isolated from the equipment? Well, it depends. If you have some concern in the way the cable was uh, bring to your facility, if maybe it was not uh, people of your company and you have no idea how they transport the cable from the factory to your facility will be will be good to do a PD test before to to connect uh, the the splices and the terminations. But I will say that mainly if if you have a major issue, uh, maybe if they uh, uh, I don't know mishandle the cable during the transport, if you do the the PD test uh, with the splices. And determinations, uh, you will be able to detect that uh, problem. So it could be, I mean, it, it's okay to do a PD test before to put uh, the splices and determination, but it's not, I will say that is not necessarily. I don't know if any, maybe uh, you have other, other consideration regarding this question. Uh, thank you, Javier. Uh, additionally, Javier, Including time for lockout, tagout, disconnecting, and reconnecting each phase of the cable and performing of the test, how much time should be estimated to complete uh, the test on a single cable? I will say that under normal circumstances, under normal uh, conditions, I will say that we will spend around between 15 minutes or 10 minutes per phase, okay? Uh, I, I will say that maybe 45 minutes will be uh, the, the, the complete time we will need for a partial discharge in the three phases, okay, at the maximum. Uh, of course, if you have some issues with the background noise level, or if you have a poor uh, concentric, uh, et cetera, et cetera, maybe you can take a longer time. But I will say that between 30 and 45 minutes will be the time to do a PD test in the three phases. Thank you, Javier. Um, Henning, how does frequency of a 0.1 hertz PD test compare with a 60 hertz factory test? Is a, fi is a 60 hertz PD test more sensitive? I think the question, I would, would um, uh, change the question a little bit and saying um, it's not the, the matter of factory test, uh, 60 hertz and field test 0.1 hertz. It's in general, the question is a 60 hertz, whether it's field or factory test, a, a more uh, uh, technically a sounder test than a 0.1 hertz uh, PD test. And uh, it's a loaded question. And um, I know certain people are in the meeting that will listen very carefully to that. <laughs> the, the answer is, is, is very simple, uh, I think. Uh, you you have 
uh, certain defects that are much more sensitive to let's say 60 hertz i would call it power frequency because power frequency which means 20 to 300 hertz has been proven equivalent to to actual power frequency at 50 or 60 hertz so i just want to say power frequency versus 0.1 hertz so certain defects have shown higher sensitivity with power frequency than uh, at 0.1 hertz so uh, overall, from a technical point, uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, uh, preferable to do PD tests with power frequency compared to 0.1 hertz. Um, there are certain defects where the difference is not as big, but, <clears throat> but um, in, in splices and terminations, there have been shown examples where where uh, you know a 0.1 hertz uh, test might show no concern because the PD level is way above uh, the inception voltage is way above uh, operating voltage, and when you do the same the same cable at uh, power frequency, you show that the PD level, the inception voltage, is already present below operating voltage, which means it's a big issue. So. So there are defects uh, that, that react differently. And in that regard, I think power frequency is overall the more uh, uh, um, preferable method because it eliminates this potentially uh, uh, masking of defects by, by using the 0.1 hertz frequency. All right, thank you, Henning. Um, Javier. My company has had some spare cables stored for over 20 years. What test would you recommend for this cable, if any, to be confident it will perform if ever the time comes? Well, it, it depends how the cable was stored. For instance, if it was under the shadow, uh, the uh, temperature conditions, etc. But I would say that maybe the jacket, uh, the first test I will do is the the, the, to test the jacket of the cable, and then I will do a, a commissioning test, a commissioning BLF test, okay? Uh, I will not concern about uh, water trees in the cable because for that, uh, for that, um, for the water trees, we need water inside of the cable and electrical stress. So I, I will not concern about the water trees, but maybe the jacket, for that reason, I will recommend the, the, to test the jacket. And, and maybe a commissioning uh, a commissioning uh, test with the BLF, and maybe to see if uh, some issues with the bend of the cable, maybe to also the, the partial discharge test. That will be the three tests I will recommend. I think uh, Javier made a very important point there. It all depends how the cable was stored. Um, we uh, participated once in a test of a cable manufacturer who had retrieved from the field service aged cable, and he had the same batch of cable in his own inventory still. And that was 15 years later. And, but those cables had to have been stored outside. And this was down in Texas. And the cables that were stored outside, even they have never been in service. They were aged much more compared to the cables that had been in service. So uh, now you can can imagine if you store something out in the in the Texas heat over that number of years, uh, there is a lot of aging going on in the polymeric material. So uh, when we when we talk about aging, it's not only electrical aging, it's also temperature aging, it's UV aging, because they have a lot of UV exposure, and so on. So, so um, uh, it's, it's hard to say, because it all depends how this cable was, was stored over this period of time. Thank you. Um, Henning, uh, what is the difference with measuring PDMV uh, instead of PC? Well, I think uh, uh, that question depends a little bit uh, what you, uh, um, which method you're using. I think if you um, uh, use a conventional method, um, you're typically using the the, the, the PD, uh, the the the, uh, the, uh, the picocoulomb, 
And um, if you use unconventional, then you use uh, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the millivolt. So so, uh, but but you know, if you use the the typical standardized method, which follow I uh, uh, IEC sixty two seventy, then uh, then you would measure in uh, in uh, in picocoulombs, the apparent charge. All right, thank you, Henning. Um, Javier, could you please explain the term dB max? Uh, yes. Uh, first, uh, my apologies because I took that uh, measurement from uh, some made here in Mexico. So in Spanish is uh, descarga parcial. So it is first the D and then the P. In, in English should be PD max, which means the maximum partial discharge detected. Okay. So as you increase the voltage, you measure the average partial discharge you have in the measurement, and also you measure the maximum uh, partial discharge you get in, in that specific voltage step. So uh, DP is indeed PD max, maximum partial discharge in the in the measurement. All right, thank you, Javier. And then I have a question uh, for Sergio. Uh, Sergio, what is the preferred cosine rectangular uh, or DAC? Uh, really depends on what it is that you want to do. So if you were doing, as mentioned before, uh, where you were doing commission testing and wanted to perform the VLF or monitor to withstand test at the same time, you would use a VLF with the cosine rectangular for your commissioning test so that you're performing both tests at once. And then from an operational standpoint, what I like to say is let's just say you're doing that test and at a splice or an accessory, you now see PD that you are at, at the levels that we were saying that you want to start questioning whether or not you should replace those. Then you can go into the damped AC, which is a pure diagnostics, to verify that that is PD you're actually seeing before you commit to actually repairing that. So it really just depends on what it is you're trying to do during that test. So damped AC is pure diagnostics. The CR. Uh, with the VLF will be the, the uh, accompanying PD with uh, very low frequency during commission testing. Thank you, Sergio. Um, Henning, would you agree that we should approach factory test results after installation under ideal conditions so that we can use factory test values as references? Uh, this, this brings back to, uh, you know, a old uh, uh, question. Um, and um, I think uh, the the common opinion on this is you cannot reproduce factory test results which are taken in a completely noise uh, in a Faraday cage environment and and expect to see the same the same approach in the field okay because in the field you don't have this shielding you you have whatever whatever the situation is you have to deal with it you have to deal with the background noise also so that's why it's it's really uh, I think uh, to say use it as a baseline I mean there is no baseline because the factory has proven by doing their own test that it 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 is basically not PD free but it's down to that five pico coulomb level and um, and uh, you you can run a field test where you cannot have this perfect shielding and you will have a certain background noise and um, and you still can see whether you have PD or you don't have PD it's 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 very obvious when you run the test so the the correlation between the factory test and the field test is really uh, a a a some people propagate you know they 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 like to talk about it but but the question really is is it is it uh, it's really not achievable if you try to do it the same way because otherwise why even do cable manufacturers then have to do all the shielding in the factory if you could produce the same result right that could save a lot of money not having to do this so i'm saying that these are two different type tests and the one proves the quality standard and the other one proves a aging sort of a a, a aging or a, a workmanship co uh, condition. Thank you, Henning. 
Uh, additionally, what special PM testing and type of equipment would you recommend for low voltage or 600 volt feeder cables in operation for over 15 years? Well, when you say 600 volt low voltage cable, uh, there is a, a certain issue with it because uh, they're normally unshielded cables. And when I have an unshielded cable, um, then I have a problem doing basically any type of test because I cannot establish a, a defined uh, test potential uh, or a, a dielectric, a, 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 a electrical field uh, between the conductor and, you know. So if the cable is direct buried, I could say, well, I could test it to ground. But um, so you can do a high pot test. But if you had a 600 volt cable laying in the cable tray, and um, you know the side that touches the cable tray, you have a ground potential, and the 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 180 degree uh, uh, opposite side is in the air, so you cannot establish a test potential. That that is not possible. So that's why low volt low voltage cable testing is is basically unless you have shielded cable low voltage shielded cable is normally not 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 feasible all right thank you henning uh i think we have time for one more question i'm going to send it over to javier um javier is pd tests uh, sensitive to sheet fault or sheath damaged or be sheath damaged if xlpe is good Oh, Javier, we might have. Sorry, you. yeah, I was muted. Yeah, my apologies. Um, well, remember, keep in mind that we will apply the voltage for the PD test between the center uh, conductor and the concentric. So uh, we are looking mainly for issues in the insulation of the cable or the splices and the terminations. So uh, problems in the in the in the uh, in the jacket of the cable will be quite difficult to detect with partial discharge. At least that that damage uh, will be related with other damage. For instance, if somebody bent too much the cable and uh, crashed the, the jacket and uh, inflicted uh, mechanical damage to the insulation of the cable, then we will detect uh, that problem, but because we have a mechanical damage in the insulation of the cable. But after the question, I will say no. Uh, uh, with the partial discharge, we cannot detect issues in the shield or the jacket of the cable. We need to do the sheet uh, test uh, to find that kind of issues. And to add to that, if you don't mind, uh, that's where the tan delta would give you an indication of a sheath if, because if the sheath is torn and water has gotten in, just as in the tables we use during the tan delta, you will see that there, it, there's wet cable. And then, of course, like you said, sheath. Sheath ball testing. All right, wonderful. Uh, so it looks like that's all the time we have for our Q and A session, and indeed our first uh, day of our seminar here. We apologize if we didn't get to your question today, but we will be following up with you offline. You're also uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, offline through our contact pages. Uh, we love hearing from you guys. We got scores of great questions. We'd love to just sit down and answer but we have some time constraints to work out today. Uh, so if you could, please remember to answer our survey when you close out our webinar. We'd greatly appreciate getting feedback from you guys, hearing what we can do better, what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, if you could, uh, remember to join us tomorrow for our second day of our virtual cable best practices seminar. You can register for that and others at our website at us.megrip.com. I'd like to thank you all for attending our uh, presenters for being here, as well as our panelists. Uh, I hope to uh, see you guys tomorrow. If not, I hope you all have a great week. <laughs>